Um, our next pit stop in our whirlwind tour through the history of uh, early modern philosophy is Hume. Um, so Hume, uh, in some ways, uh, responds to Descartes. The bigger picture is that um, on the one hand side, we have philosophers uh, like Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Wolf in, in, in Germany, uh, who are broadly rationalist philosophers that believe in reason's capacity of arriving at uh, fundamental truths about the nature of the world. Uh, on the other hand, um, so, so as the idea of fact, you just, you know, you, you go to your philosophical study and think, and that metaphysical truths are not unlike mathematical truths where, uh, you know, you don't need to do experiments in order to, um, to figure out what your, what your principles, what your axioms, and so forth are. Um, on the other hand, um, you have the empiricists, usually uh, considered the British empiricists, because most of them seem to come from, from what we now know as Great Britain. Um, and most famously, perhaps, uh, uh, Locke, Berkeley, and Hume. Uh, Berkeley will play his own role in our, in our little uh, story here, but um, for now I want to focus on Hume. Uh, because Hume, in a way, drew the skeptical consequences from, from uh, Descartes, the pickle that Descartes landed us in, uh, more radically than, than, than the others had. Berkeley was in his own way radical, but uh, we're, we're, we're going to look at that separately. Um, okay, so first thing to note, if we start back with... Um, Descartes' mind's eye, we, uh, we find that um, Hume essentially buys it. Hume essentially um, agrees that that's, this is all we got. Uh, so one of uh, one of the reasons why Hume is a skeptic is because he has this, uh, you know, he, he does have this external world skepticism. The nature, reality, existence of an external physical material world is a problem for Hume. Um, now, but, you know, there's debates in the, in the literature of how much of a problem uh, Hume actually thought it was. You know, Hume also famously is, uh, has a, a pragmatic streak where he basically says, you know, that's what it looks like to us in our philosophical study. but uh, once we start stepping out in the real world, uh, you know, uh, obviously we believe in in the existence of an external world. So his his skepticism is a is a studied um, uh, mitigated skepticism. But uh, for now, what I want to highlight is that that Hume uh, basically Hume's picture of the mind is that well, we do have some kind of awareness of uh, of some kind of a show that's going on in, in front of our mind's eye. And that show, Hume thinks, is composed of two general types of uh, entities. Uh, on the one hand, he says there's impressions. And on the other hand, there's ideas. Um, and his fundamental philosophical principles principle is that the ideas uh, are copies the copies of impressions or copied from impressions um, what does copy mean well Hume is actually uh, quite careful here um, and he says look there's really nothing beyond um, the force and vivacity of these ideas uh, that, differentiate, that differentiates them from impressions. So um, the, the, the picture we arrive at is that um, it looks at first as if there were those two mental entities. Well, actually, it turns out there's really only kind of one. Um, and it comes along a sliding scale of what he calls force and vivacity. 
he wants to be a, a, a scientist of the mind, and he wants to minimize um, the assumptions he makes and he, the assumptions he brings into this. So unlike uh, Descartes, who, who gladly helped himself to a causal principle and to a notion of substance and to a notion of free will and thereby to a notion of God and all the rest of it, uh, Hume says, well, if I want to be scientific about it, meaning as an introspectionist exercise, um, all I find when I when I introspect is I you know there's a there's a mental universe going on, but I find that certain impress, certain of these um, goings on are uh, very forceful. Those are the ones that I call impressions, and others are less forceful. Those are the ones I call ideas. And then he has a theoretical principle that says, well, how how come that some are less forceful? And he says, well, they must have been copied from preceding impressions. And there's you know, quite a bit of literature out there on, on, on the nature of this copy principle and whether it's an a priori principle uh, in its own right and whether a human is actually entitled to something like that. But for now, let's sidestep all of that and just say um, and realize that so far, um, Hume seems to firmly agree with uh, Descartes' picture of the mind um, up to this point. Now, um, and, and, and I say this in part because one way you might want to motivate the vivacity of the impressions is to say, well, what Hume means by impressions are really sensory impressions, and why do they have vivacity? Well, because if I have, back to my chair, if I have a visual perception of a chair, that's forceful and vivacious because there's a chair there, right? There's a currently existing object in the external world impinging on my senses and my representation of this thing is of it just as it is. That's what explains the vivacity. Hume doesn't go there. Hume is, you know, good philosopher, very careful here, and basically says, no, can't say that, can't make any assumptions about any of this stuff. All I can say is that I have a couple of forceful ideas, and then I have a couple of less forceful ideas. Um, or a couple of forceful mental goings-on, those are the impressions, and a couple of less forceful mental goings-on, those are the ideas. All right, so... Um, 